Hey guys, thanks so much for all the support. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please feel free to do so. I'd recently moved to this new place in a small suburb, which was quite remote and about two hours away from other civilizations. My new neighbors' names were Greg, Eric, Alan, and Caroline. They each introduced themselves on the first day I moved there. My place wasn't all that big. It was a two-story house, and for some reason, the master bedroom was on the first floor. The first few days, I spent trying to find my way to places around the town and figuring out things which was quite complicated despite the place only having not more than 20 people. It's a guess. Everyone seemed nice and friendly, always willing to help me out if I needed anything. Greg ran a supermarket, and when I mentioned I was looking for a job, he hired me as a cashier. I was surprised by the pay he offered me, even though his store was always almost empty. Only a fool would reject the golden offer, that was why I agreed without a second thought. About a month went by, and I don't know why I started having sleep problems, probably because I was still not used to the whole new place yet. I tried whatever method I could find to try falling asleep, but none of them worked. With each passing day, it only got worse. Now, I'm not the kind of guy who deliberately stays up until late playing with my phone, gaming on PC, or chatting away with friends. No, I like my sleep, and the fact that neither medication nor chamomile tea was able to help me fall asleep seemed like a problem. That night, when I couldn't fall asleep and was looking out the window, I froze upon seeing something strange. Alan, with two mysterious figures, was carrying a corpse and was headed towards his house. The way I could tell she was a corpse was this state of the body, pale and on the verge of decaying. Every single one of them was almost dressed entirely in black as if it was for the funeral. It would have been that they were about to bury the body. Perhaps she was a deceased family member he had brought back from the hospital. Either way, there seemed to be something weird and creepy about the entire thing. As I saw them disappear into Alan's home, I stood there for a few moments before closing the window and going to bed. Laying there, I couldn't stop thinking about what I witnessed as multiple questions and suspicion arose from that. The next day, while I was working, Curiosity got the better of me when I saw Greg entering the store. I rushed to him to ask about Alan. However, my steps halted when I saw Alan entering the store behind him with some girl. Upon noticing me, he waved at me and as he moved a bit further from the individual following him, revealing her face. A shiver ran down my spine as I recognized her face. She was the dead girl I saw last night. Unlike before, she didn't look pale. Instead, her skin was glowing and red. Wh who is she? I stuttered the question as I tried to control my legs from shaking, hiding the fear creeping up on me. Alan glanced at the girl and his lips curled with an affectionate smile as he said, This is my wife, Julie. Greg approached her and started talking in a way that seemed he knew this which was weird because a few days after I moved in, Alan asked for dating tips. I concluded I must have been mistaken and either saw wrong that night or fell asleep and had a nightmare. I introduced myself to Julie despite being terrified of her and tried to act normally. Not wanting to pry more into the matter, I returned to work. Since I was only able to get three hours of sleep, I was feeling exhausted as hell. Greg told me he had to be somewhere and asked to close the store two hours before its closing time. The way he left in such a hurry made me wonder where he might be headed. Anyway, once I closed the door, I returned to my house which was within walking distance from the store. Once I reached home, I took a sleeping pill and gulped it in one gulp. The pills were my last resort after everything, 
Because I was so tired due to lack of sleep, I couldn't go on like that. That night, I was awakened by uncontrollable thirst. I got up from bed and headed to the kitchen for some water. After drinking and returning to bed, I realized I couldn't fall back asleep. As I lay on the bed, staring at the ceiling, I was reminded of the events from the previous night, and I got up and randomly walked to the window. However, as I looked outside, my eyes grew wide in terror. Just like Alan, Greg, too, was in black attire accompanied by two people carrying a dead body. Even after they disappeared inside his house, I couldn't stop my racing heart and the feeling of suffocating fear taking hold of my body. I was about to close the window when I noticed Caroline, who instead of a still body was carrying a skeleton. The skeleton was wearing a newly bought suit, which was even more spine chilling. For the rest of the night, I twisted and turned in my bed. When the ray of sunlight entered my room through the glass window, I got up and rushed outside. As I stood outside staring at each house one by one of my neighbors, I couldn't help but feel panicked. That was when I saw Caroline's house door open and a blonde man came out wearing the same outfit as the skeleton I saw. He grabbed the newspaper before he raised his head and met my eyes. Then he smiled and waved at me as if we knew each other. I grabbed my hair and pulled it in frustration and fear as I saw him leave. That was when I saw Greg heading out in sports attire with a gorgeous woman. Yes, you guessed right, she too was a corpse the night before. I felt my head spinning as I turned around and headed inside my house. There was something wrong with this town and I didn't want to danger myself by staying a minute longer. With the help of some connections, I managed to get a temporary place where I could move to before finding a permanent place. So I called a moving truck and we started loading my stuff in there. Before I could get in the truck and leave, Eric approached me. I ignored his warning and started the truck. However, as I was about to cross the border, I remembered another truck driving at full speed in my direction. I tried to let it pass, but instead, it crashed right into me. There's no memory of what happened next, for I blacked out instantly. But when I woke up, I was at my new home with none other than my beloved wife, Christina. Christi there used to be a time when I used to visit bars quite often within a week, but it has been a long time since then. Now I'm too busy with my work as a lawyer that I hardly get any time for myself, let alone partying in a bar. Currently I'm occupied with a sensitive case that I'm set to solve by any means necessary. Still, whenever I pass by any alley where there are lots of bars or clubs and see those homeless people selling things, I'm reminded of all those nights when I used to go see her before that incident took place a few months ago. The first time I saw her was the night when I was visiting X nightclub. It was one of the usual spots for our friends to hang out together. Her clothes looked shabby, and her hair was in a mess, but despite all those negative things, she still looked more gorgeous than any woman I had seen. She must be around in her late thirties, but even her sylph-like figure could not hide her beauty. Her complexion was amazing. She had the longest eyelashes, prettiest eyes, and the best cheekbone. All the features that I couldn't help but admire, even as a woman. She was selling stone-like jewelry, which quite few to be able to make any profit for the day, but still, I had the sudden urge to buy whatever she was selling, since I couldn't withstand watching her in this condition. Those of you who are thinking why a girl like me was thinking of such things, well, first thing, I guess it was the sympathy which is a common human nature among us, and second, she somehow reminded me of my dead elder sister. I walked to her and asked the price of them. And surprisingly, she was selling them at a rather cheap price despite such fine handcrafting. No, seriously, if you were to buy such stone handmade jewelry online or in a store, they would cost 10 times more than what she was offering, or maybe more. Looking at how she had just a few of them, I bought all of them. And the slightly happy expression on her face was enough to make my heart feel a bit at peace. 
The next day, I saw her again with a few other ornaments, so I went closer and started asking her about them. As time passed, I somehow became a regular customer, and the two of us started to exchange more than a few friendly words. Her companionship started to feel more assuring and delightful than the friends in that club who were here to seduce men more than to have fun with me. There was a time when I only went to that nightclub so I could commune with her. Over time, I got to know a few things about her life. She was married to a guy to her family's wishes, but wherever she talked about her marriage, I couldn't help but notice her sorrowful tone. And even though she never said this on her own, I figured she wasn't quite happy with her husband. Her barely visible bumps suggested that she was expecting, and that might be the reason she was trying to gather a few bucks by selling homemade trinkets. This made me come to another conclusion. Either she was divorced to her husband, or her life partner didn't earn enough to save for the baby, causing her to go on her own even in this condition. One day, when I came out of the bar at the same time when she used to arrive to sell her embellishments, I found her waiting outside with nothing in her hands. Out of worry, I rushed to her and started asking what's wrong, but instead of telling me the cause of her worries, she looked at me with her shiny eyes, and her lips formed into a crestfallen smile. I stood there frozen as she maneuvered a small pendant with a black gemstone around my neck and handed a piece of paper in my hand. For some reason, her actions felt heart-wrenching, and a small droplet of tear made its way down my cheek, which she wiped with her thumb before saying, If you're free sometime, do pay me a visit. And then she walked away. I felt like I was losing my sister all over again as I watched her back disappear bit by bit. The next day, I didn't see her in that alley, so I impatiently waited for a little more than an hour hoping for her to arrive, but she didn't. Not that day, and not any other day after that. There was so much that I couldn't get to say to her that I wanted to, and now it felt like I would never be able to. I continued waiting for her outside that alley for a few more days, before I remembered the address she gave me written on that piece of paper. Deciding that I would visit her and make sure to bring her home with me just in case she was having a hard time with her husband, I headed toward her supposed residence. But when I got there, what I saw was not a habitant house or an apartment. Instead, it was an abandoned building. I hesitantly walked in, only to get hit by a nasty stench. Covering my nose, I started walking toward the source. And once I got there, my heart jumped to my throat as I let out a sorrowful scream. Her guts were shattered around her lifeless body as she was crushed under a huge rock, which didn't seem like it was fallen from there. Instead, it looked as if someone purposefully smashed her head with it. My leg gave up as I wailed like a howling dog in front of her rotting corpse. I couldn't understand. She was perfectly alive the last time I saw her. That what went wrong and who did it to her? My eyes went between her bleeding legs, making my heart feel as if I was going to burst any moment with this terrifying yet despairing scene. I took out my phone and dialed 911 with my trembling hands and wavering thoughts. The cops reached within 20 minutes at the address I provided them and started asking me questions. I told them about everything from the first time I saw her to how I came to find her. After they took charge of the crime scene, they asked me to go home and they would call me if they were to need my assistance. For the next few days, I couldn't eat, sleep, or focus properly. I stopped going to nightclubs and continued staying at home since I was mentally and emotionally a mess. There was only resentment and unending hatred left in my heart for the bastard who did this to her. I couldn't blame anyone when my real sister died of coronavirus, but this time, when I finally found my sister in her presence, someone purposefully stole her away from me. Who would do so cruel to do that to her and her unborn child? The investigation had started, and the police disclosed her husband's strange disappearance after her death. After a few days, the autopsy results were out, but something didn't add up. According to the results, she died on Friday night, but that was impossible since I met her the next Saturday evening. I touched the stone that she gave me and something hit me sending a shiver down my spine. 
Is that why the address she gave me was of that place? Was she already dead and wanted me to discover her body? I immediately took out the pendant and started looking at it carefully, trying to understand if it was a clue to find out who killed her. As I was pinpointing all of my memories with her, I remembered I had seen this necklace more often than I thought. She used to wear it all the time. That meant this might contain the fingerprints of that killer, and luckily, I didn't touch the stone that much, so there was possible that it hadn't faded away just yet. I practically ran to the police station after giving a call to the officer who was in charge of her case. After telling them that I had found this necklace outside the nightclub, I submitted it as evidence. They sent it immediately to the forensic lab for testing, and just as I thought it did contain another set of fingerprints that were older than mine. It was her husband, Javier. My hunch was right when I found out he was missing and was the suspect list. He murdered his wife and child. There was no way I was going to let him off easy. I was prepared to go to the end. I filed a separate report against him and hired a bunch of private investigators to find him at any cost. That bastard had taken out a life insurance policy in her name and was thinking of getting that money, so there was no way he was not going to make a move on that. And even if he didn't, even if the search for him was to go in vain, I am set to find that son of a bitch and drag him into the hell where he deserves to be. I have a clue in my hand that suggests that the piece of shit was hiding somewhere in Las Vegas. That filth has no clue what's coming his way. Just wait till I get my hands on him. My name is Rachel, I'm 23 and I'm from Dublin in Ireland. The other day I was on my way home from work and my route home takes me through a park that I walk through almost every single day. The path I was down cuts through the park diagonally and there are metal benches at certain spots along the path. Then the other day, as I was walking through the park, there was a man sat on one of the benches. He looked like he was just minding his own business. Him being there didn't set off any alarm bells at all. I'm not stupid. And I'd been in a handful of situations already where I'd seen a creepy fella hanging about and thought, nah, I think I'll take a cab home tonight. But in this case, I didn't get any of those vibes at all. I walked down the path and he didn't pay me any attention at first, but as I got within a few feet of him, I heard him say something that couldn't have been directed at anyone but me. I didn't hear exactly what he said, but I just ignored him at first. But then as I passed him, I saw him stand up from the bench out of the corner of my eye and I realized he was following me. I took out my earbuds, then as I carried on walking with the man asking hello, in a really obnoxious way behind me, I set my phone to record a video and then tried my best to record him without him realizing as I carried on walking down the path. He kept asking me, hello, are you deaf or something? Until I had my phone recording and I said, no, I'm not, I just don't want to talk to you. The fellow was easily in his 50s and I realized that he was probably feeling brave on account of the half-empty bottle of vodka that he was carrying with him. But as I actually talked to him, it was like talking to a child. I told him I didn't want to talk to him and he asked me, why not? I told him I just didn't and that he shouldn't be following people he doesn't know through parks. He told me there was nothing wrong with walking with someone, and that he just wanted to be my friend. He carried on like that, being completely pig-headed and irritating, but he didn't escalate so I just kept on walking until we were only a few feet away from the exit of the park, with the street I live on just on the other side. There's a set of those anti-cycle gates near the end, so I had to slow my pace a bit to walk through, and as I did, he asked me, well, can I have a hug then instead? And I was like, no, you, you bloody well cannot have a hug. Are you mental or something? I know it probably wasn't the smartest move to antagonize the guy, but I was furious that he'd have the cheek to ask a stranger that in the first place. I was so outraged that I stopped as I was about halfway through the cycle gate, but I think that's exactly what he wanted. He reached out and grabbed hold of the arm of my coat. I tried to pull away from him and he stepped forward closer to the gate and managed to get a grip of my arm. 
I remember looking around really fast to see if there was anyone I could call over for help, and when I didn't see anyone, all that anger I felt turned to total fear. I tried to tell him to get off of me, but my voice broke up as I felt a lump forming in my throat. I didn't think I'd get so scared so quickly, and I suppose feeling it hit me all at once was just a little too much. When I pulled my arm away as hard as I could, and I expected him to look angry or something, he didn't. He looked like he was having the time of his life. He had this big grin on his face, like he was loving every second of seeing me so frightened, and that only made me more and more afraid that he was going to do something further. I kept moving through the cycle gate after shouting at him to leave me alone. I didn't look back. I wasn't sure if he was following me or not, but all I could think to do was keep walking at a brisk pace and hope I ran into someone I could ask to help me. I turned the corner, and there was a man in his yard and a half a football pitch down the street tending to his front garden. I just remember power walking towards him hoping that I wasn't followed, and really wishing that I'd chosen some flatter shoes. He saw me before I got close, and I'm guessing he could see what a state I was in, because he stopped and stared before asking if I was okay as I got closer. I looked behind me one last time and felt this wave of relief as I saw the man who had been following me was gone. I'd somehow managed to keep it together until that moment, but when I realized I was safe, the dam just burst, and... I ended up bursting into tears as I asked the gardener man to call the Garda, which is what we call the police here, by the way. I saw the man again the other day when I was walking home. The Garda said they'd given him a talking to about approaching young women when it's unwelcome, but he was sat there in the exact same spot as last time, like he was just waiting for me to walk past again. I walk home a different route now. I'd rather be safe and get home later than risk walking past that bastard again. I just don't understand why men have to be like that. You may be familiar with the dedicated cleanup crew transforming a messy football stadium into a pristine one. As a former member of those crews, I can attest to the rigorous process. For each NFL game, there were three teams in total. The first team consisted of approximately 100 to 150 workers who would quickly pick up any trash during the game. The remaining two teams, each with around 50 workers, were responsible for cleaning up after the game ended. One team cleaned the stadium, while the other focused on the parking lots. Overall, it was an organized and efficient operation that ensured the stadium was in top condition for the next game. The team I was in would mostly stay late, often until 1 a.m., to scrub the stadium and return the next day to spray down the seats and concourses and clean the suites and food service areas. Late one night, my colleagues and I were diligently tidying up the premises following a game, and the time was already past 1 a.m. As the workload was nearly complete, most of the staff had departed and intended to finalize the task upon their return the next day. However, I was determined not to have to sacrifice my rest two days in a row, and therefore, I made it a point to see the job through to completion that very night. You stay if you want, my body needs sleep, so good night, my friend, Nick and Fred said in unison as they grew tired of my persistent drive to complete the work, even after everyone had departed. At times I find it difficult to comprehend my stubbornness. It was not like I would receive some extra pay if I finished the work. Yet I persisted nonetheless. But since I had made up my mind, I continued working. As I diligently scrubbed the final row, an unexpected urge suddenly hit me, like a ton of bricks. I needed to use the restroom, and I needed to use it now. I paused my work and walked inside, trying to keep my composure. A faint sound caught my attention as I approached the restroom, 
emanating from the other end of the facility. I hesitated momentarily, wondering if someone else was still finishing their work just like me. But I decided to ignore the noise and proceeded to enter the men's room. As I was using the restroom, the light bulb suddenly began flickering before wholly going out, making it impossible to see anything. The sudden darkness left me terrified and disoriented as I attempted to survey my surroundings. Once I had finished, I somehow managed to flush the toilet and pull up my pants before making my way out of the stall in the pitch blackness. I tried to look through my pockets to find my cell phone, only to realize I had left it behind. My heart sank as I knew I would have to navigate the restroom sightlessly. I groped around in the darkness until I found the basin and began to wash my hands. Suddenly, I sensed a presence at the door, causing my heart to race. In the hopes that it was just my mind playing tricks on me, I completed my hand washing and quickly made my way toward the exit. As I approached the stadium, an eerie sensation enveloped me, as if a figure was standing at the end, making me halt my steps. Then, two glistening white lights appeared, replacing the eyes of the shadow in front of me, only to vanish as quickly as they appeared. It dawned on me that my decision to stay behind after everyone left was ill-fated. With adrenaline coursing through my veins, I sprinted towards the stadium exit, only to behold the exact dark figure standing in my path. I was petrified as it disappeared again, since I had no idea where he could appear next. That was when I felt a chill on the back of my neck, and as I hesitantly turned around, I was met with the two shiny eyes only an inch distance. It was almost as if I had forgotten how to breathe. Suddenly, it felt like someone had grabbed my throat and started choking me without any visible hand around my neck or touch sensation there. My senses started to fade, along with my breathing getting shallower, and it wasn't long before I passed out due to the lack of oxygen. When consciousness returned to me, the gentle light of dawn filtered through the darkness, and my body was drenched in perspiration. With trepidation, I cautiously scanned my surroundings for any sign of the ghastly figure that had terrorized me the night before, but to my relief I was utterly alone. I hastily got up and gathered my belongings, my phone and jacket, from where I had left them at the stadium the previous night before running to my car. While driving back to my apartment, I attempted to contact my superior, but to no avail. Consequently, I sent a text message notifying them that I could not attend work today. The night's events continued to replay in my head, causing my heart to palpitate uncontrollably. Upon arriving at my apartment, I went to the bathroom, hoping to calm my nerves with a cold shower, but it proved ineffective. The feeling of an unseen presence constricting my neck and suffocating me persisted. I went to my bed and tried to sleep. It was challenging with everything that happened, but eventually I managed to drift off. Still, the moment I did, I found myself standing in the middle of the stadium with that terrifying dark figure in front of me. My body started to tremble, and I could feel cold sweat beads dripping down my forehead. I woke up screaming and found myself burning from a high fever. The nightmare continued for about a week, which was followed by me waking up covered in sweats or my fever rising before I decided to see a therapist. The fear of re-encountering him burned in my brain, and I couldn't bring myself to return to work, so I quit. Even as I slowly recovered, I had to find work in a different place with a day shift. However, 
even to this day, the thought of that harrowing experience sends shivers down my spine. The incident remains vividly etched in my mind, as if it had only happened yesterday. Last year in the early spring, my friends and I decided to go on a fun trip since we all had been quite busy for the past few months and couldn't spend time together. Our friend Adonis, who was rich like a prince, had a villa in Greece, so we decided to go there. I informed my family beforehand in case they suddenly decided to plan something else, and they seemed to have a habit of doing that. We met at Adonis's house one night and discussed our trip plans. We came to the conclusion that we would fly to Sweden first and hang out there for two nights before making the trip to Rhodes. After drinking a bit, we all headed back to our houses. Flight tickets were booked the next day, and all we had to do was wait for the day to arrive. I thought everything would go smoothly till the day where we were flying to Sweden, but it turned out I was wrong. Two days before my trip, I got a call from my Aunt Flora. My eyes started twitching as I saw her name flashing on my cell phone screen. She was definitely planning something. So I chose to ignore her call until after I departed from home. She gave up after calling me about three times, and I sighed in relief. My Aunt Flora was famous for arranging parties, trips, and family vacations unannounced. And there was something about her. Perhaps she had some strong convincing power, but I could never deny her. That was why I knew if I answered that call, I would break down and end up canceling my trip with friends, and there was no way I would let that happen. The next day, after returning from work, I started packing my suitcase, and as I was in the middle of doing it, a slight knock distracted me. I turned around to find my little sister, Sandra, standing in the doorway, waiting for my permission to enter. She walked in after I told her that she could enter, and as she drew closer, I noticed her tense expression. What is it, Bear? I asked with worry. It's Aunt Flora. They can't find her anywhere. I hated my movements as I heard her say this. I did notice Mom and Dad's absence at the house, but I thought it might be because they usually go for date night every Thursday. What are you talking about, Sandra? I know she planned something, so quit the act. She called on my cell phone last night. After saying that, I resumed packing. When we were kids, Laura would always reject her invites. Aunt Flora always acted like she was sick, making us rush there, only to find out she was well. That was why I remembered her tactics. Did she, she call you? But Leo, she's been missing since last night. The horrified look on her face as she said that didn't seem fake at all. I started to wonder if what she was saying was true, but a part of my mind kept telling me that it could be just like those times when I believed she was severely ill. Don't you think we should go there? She asked with tear-filled eyes. I looked down at my half-packed suitcase and bit my lips in frustration before taking out my phone and calling Adonis to tell him I couldn't go with them. I told him about my aunt's disappearance, and he understood. The next morning, Sandra, Laura, and I drove to Lublin, where we used to live. It took about two hours to get there, but I felt something was off when I was in the driveway. The noises coming from inside made me uncomfortable, and as I entered the house, my frustration peaked when I saw my parents laughing and conversing with Aunt Teresa and her husband. Don't tell me you all planned this! As I said this, I heard my sisters giggling from behind. I'm sorry, brother, but Aunt Flora... Laura started speaking, but I cut her off in the middle. Aw, to hell with Aunt Flora! Do you have any idea how unacceptable this is? This trip was important to me, and I had to cancel it because I was genuinely worried! I stumbled on my words upon noticing Aunt Flora entering in a wedding dress, looking more gorgeous than ever. I immediately turned my gaze to Mom in a confused expression, and she just shrugged. I'm sorry for forcing you to come, Leo. I turned my gaze away in guilt as she said that. But everyone's presence was important for me, she added. Though I desperately wanted to go on my vacation, there was no way I would have missed her wedding if I had known about it. Besides, my friends would have been on the flight by now. 
Though I was still mad at them that they didn't tell me before I made my plans, I still attended the ceremony with a smile. Three days after the wedding, I got a call from Adonis' father asking me why we hadn't reached the villa yet and why wasn't Adonis' call getting connected. I told them I wasn't with them because something urgent arose. It was supposed to be the day when they were supposed to reach Rhodes, so I couldn't understand why they were late. After reassuring his father that they must be on their way, I disconnected the call. I tried calling them, but just as he told me, their numbers were out of reach. I didn't get any calls from his father for the rest of the day, so I thought they must have reached there by then, but their numbers were still available. The next day, when I still couldn't reach them, I got worried and called Adonis' his father, asking them if they were there. His voice was filled with sadness as he told me he had no idea where they were, and his servant from the villa told him that they were still not there. I tried everything to reach them, but it was no use. About a week later, I got a call from an unknown number, and when I answered it, I immediately recognized the trembling voice, Gilbert. He told me that the car they rented caught on fire when they were still inside, and only he could survive while everyone else died. He was stuck in the middle of nowhere with no idea how to reach a hospital. The only way he could call me was to borrow a phone from someone he met on his way, but the man had somewhere else to go, so he couldn't help him get to the hospital since it was so far from where they were. I immediately called Adonis' dad and told him everything. But when I asked him to help Gilbert, his reply shook me to the core. Why is he alive if everyone else is dead? He disconnected the call after that. I called 911 after that and asked for their help. They reassured me that they would do something. But it's been a year since then, and I haven't heard from them. I have no idea if he was rescued, died, or is still suffering somewhere, waiting for help to arrive. I often wonder if I should have done something more, or put more effort into helping them. It was the late 90s, and I was just out of the school, and I needed some extra money because I wanted to leave the place I was in, and the only way was to do that, get enough money, and leave the town. I had saved enough to buy a car, and now I was waiting to get some more money to stably move to another state, and to do that, I had to do all kinds of jobs, and one of the jobs that I was definitely not interested in was babysitting. I have always had a no-go for babysitting. I found babysitting to be one of the jobs that I never really wanted to do. I made up my mind that babysitting is not going to be that one job that I will do. I was working to fulfill my goal, but there was no way I wanted to be a babysitter. I just never had the kind of attitude you need for the job, and I am not very good with children. So it can be the case why I did not like the job of babysitting. I was ready to leave the state for good, but I still had some gigs that I wanted to do to get that extra cash, but nothing was lined up for me, and I was getting desperate to leave the place. Then out of the blue, a gig came up that my friend told me about, and he said that it pays really well and is just right up by my alley. I asked him what the gig was, and he said, it's some rich guy. He's going out of the country with his new model trophy wife of his, but there is the daughter. She's around 16 right now, and he's looking for a babysitter for her. I thought you can be good. You're 21 and you're responsible. He's not going to find a babysitter like you. And then I looked at him and said, why would you need a babysitter for a 16 year old man? She can take care of herself. I'm not interested. And then my friend continued, the job pays a thousand dollars for a week. That is way too much. You can do the gig and then leave this place for good. It would take you weeks or maybe months otherwise. He was right, and I knew that I had to take the gig in order to rush the process of me leaving the States. And then I decided in the practicality of the situation that I will take the job and complete it. I decided to book an appointment, and then I left for the interview once it was scheduled. It was not one of those rich guy houses, it was extra rich house. There was everything made of quality that we didn't even know that exists. Everything was fine, and even the security was way tighter than even banks. And then the man came walking with a cigar in his hand and his model wife right beside him and he said, I know you might be wondering why I would hire a babysitter for a 16 year old. You see, she's old now, 
but she doesn't have any friends, and while I go spend my honeymoon, it will be the right way to find her a friend. You look good enough, but if you harm her, you know your family will be dead before you. I looked at the man with stern conviction, and then I took up the job. Her name was Emily. I met Emily, and even she was weirded out by the whole babysitter thing, so I just told her, think of me as your friend or something. And then we hit it off very soon, and I spent my weeks. I could hang out with her a lot, and we would talk endlessly. And then as the week was about to end, she admitted that she liked, and I told her that I liked her too, and I told her that I would wait for her to turn 18. We were about to kiss when we heard the gunshots. It was the guards. They were dropping down dead, and there was nothing that I could do to dodge the guns. So I took Emily and hit her in the cabinets of the kitchen, and then tried apprehending the guys as I shouted, I'm just the babysitter! I'm just the babysitter! The man shouted, Stop! It's just a boy! And then the tallest man came out and said, Tell him that we are done doing business with him. He interferes, he dies, and so is family. Turns out it wasn't the best of work that Emily's father did. It was the moment I held her hand when the men went away and asked her, Do you want to run away with me? And she said yes. And since then, we have been together, seeking adventures of our own. Emily's father tried coming after us, but it didn't go well for him. I've made some friends along the years that are not really fond of Emily's father, so we don't have to worry on that front. We just drive like nomads and live our life one adventure at a time. It's 2010, and we still haven't lost our sense of adventure, and neither we will. Are you sure you're going to be alright at home? Mom asked one more time before leaving. Yes, Mama, I'll be fine. Now go! I almost pushed her after saying that. Don't worry, your father will be back at 10 p.m., so you won't be alone for long, she said looking at me in concern. Yeah, I know. Now, bye. Otherwise, you guys are going to be late, I said with a smile. She is right, Mom. If you keep this up, we are going to be late. Guess who might have said that? The sister you never wanted, but ended up getting and loving younger sister Gracie. I teased her by sticking out my tongue before shutting the door behind them. She gets annoyed whenever I do that. You guys must be wondering where they're going and why in the world I was staying at home. Well, they are going to Taylor Swift's music concert, which I would have given anything to go to. Since I have recently started to develop new symptoms where even the slightest loud noise makes my head throb, I couldn't. Doctors have suggested that there was a possibility that I'm developing hyperacusis in one of my ears, but it could be something else as well. So here I am missing my favorite singer's concert. Now that I was home alone, I wasn't going to let this chance go to waste. I was about to put this time to good use. So I put on my earplugs and went to the kitchen to make a few snacks for my entertainment time. Looking at how loud noises affected me, I resisted my urge to put music on, but I could still do some dance moves without it. So with not so expert steps, I went ahead and made some popcorn for myself. Sandwich was already in the sandwich maker, and now all I needed was some cookies and a coke bottle from the refrigerator and my feast would start. Once I was done, I grabbed them and took them upstairs to my room, where my one person party was going to be held. I was never much of a movie person, instead my alone times were dedicated to books and comics that were far more interesting than any movie. Once I start reading a book, I wouldn't put it down until I was finished, and the moment the ending was read by me, it would feel like the world had come to an end. The process keeps repeating itself with all the interesting books I find. Now I love books and reading stuff, but I'm not that good at studying, I'm just an average student. You know whenever my relatives visit and invade my privacy by barging into my room, they think I'm a book nerd who must be studying all the time as they look around and judge by the amount of books in my room. They would be like, wow, Chloe must be a genius, you guys must be so proud. I wish my child was like her and my parents go, ha, yeah, sure, but I know just by looking at their eyes what they think whenever this happens. Study, yeah, my ass. My parents are cool about such things and they never discuss a result score with anyone. Guess they might have suffered the same thing in the past to be this way. And I feel so thankful to them whenever my classmates say that their parents shame them by comparing their score with their neighbor's kids or some relative's kids. Well, enough with all this. Let's get back to me entering my room with a handful of snacks. 
after putting them carefully on the bed, I went ahead and grabbed one of my favorite books, and the moment I opened it to read, my phone started vibrating. Annoyingly, I looked over the screen only to see it was Adam texting me. He was my boyfriend, but I wasn't talking to him because of an argument we had, and now that I tried to remember what started it, I couldn't remember. Accepting defeat was not going to happen. So I stayed mad until he apologizes to me first for whatever we argued, since I know it might have been a mistake in the first place. I still replied to his text message, a bit of a cold response per se, but if he were to try a little bit harder, I was going to forgive him with a little added sexting to bonus it. And looking at his constant messages, he was going to earn that bonus. After a few apologetic and cutesy messages of his, we made up and started talking naughty things. As I was busy on the phone, I heard a thud sound coming from downstairs, which was rather loud since it sent a headache to me, but thinking it was dad, I ignored it. An urge to pee made me get up from my bed and walk downstairs, and as I was walking to the toilet, I saw from the corner of my eye that the sensor light on the front door was turned on, which meant someone was there. Dad, you home? I asked, but there was no response. I didn't think of it much and went inside the restroom to finish my business. After about 10 minutes, I got out there only to notice the sensor light was still on. Dad, what are you still standing there for? As I walked there while saying this, I froze, as I saw no one was there and the light was still on. My heart leaped to my throat. There was no way the sensor light had a problem since it was brand new, so why in the world was it still on? I was nervous and terrified, thinking what might be standing there but instead of turning and running back to my room, my legs just froze, refusing to move. I stood there, panic-stricken for about one minute, when the light suddenly turned off, giving me another jump scare. That was when the doorknob started to move, and with the opening door, the light turned on again. I was about to scream when I saw Dad standing there with his hand on his chest. Guess he might have been surprised seeing me standing frozen there. Ah, Dad! You scared me! Why did you go back outside? And what is up with this stupid light? He seemed to be startled as I asked him that. He looked up at me before saying, What are you talking about, Chloe? I just got here. Upon hearing that, my face turned pale, and I hesitantly looked over at the sensor light. Dad, can you get the sensor light checked? I said with my slight trembling voice. Guess father sensed something was wrong, and he nodded yes. After that, I went directly to my room and hid myself under the blanket. It might have just been my imagination, but I was still feeling scared to my core, thinking, what if it wasn't? The next day, vindication in the light that there was nothing wrong with it doubled the fear in me. Nothing out of the ordinary happened after that one incident, but I'm still scared of it to this day. At times, I wonder what in the world it was that day. Was there something paranormal in action? This happened a few years ago while I was living in Florida. I'm a female and around 20 years old. I had been going through a pretty rough patch in my life and had the great idea to take a few tabs of LSD and go to St. Augustine for a day trip to take my mind off of everything. St. Augustine is notorious for being insanely haunted, but it's one of my favorite places to go. I went by myself and made the three hour drive. This wasn't out of the ordinary for me. I often went on adventures like this by myself and I always had a great time. So I went to the historic downtown and spent my peak looking around all the cool shops and even made one hell of a walk to the lighthouse. Passing by tons of tourists and people going about their day when you're tripping balls walks the fine line of exciting and terrifying, and I love that feeling. When I started coming down, I went back to my car and decided to go to the beach as there was still a solid two hours of daylight left. I thought being on the beach during sunset while being in the more mental part of the trip would be amazing. I found some random pull-off area that you had to drive down a mile or so before you hit the parking lot. Not one other car was in it, which was welcomed after being in crowds all day, and this lot was a giant circle and was surrounded by trees and marshy land. Off to the side was a boardwalk that you had to walk quite a ways down to get to the beach. 
Once I finally got to the sand, I left my shoes by the boardwalk so I could find where it was when I came back. I was still not in my right mind by any means and the entrance was pretty well hidden. I then walked for a solid 45 minutes down the beach. I found a nice spot with a washed up log where I could put my bag and clothes while I went for a swim. While I was in the water I started getting to myself and thinking about all the stories about how extremely haunted this beach truly was. Not long after that I had a very intense burning up my side. Think like if you get a severe scratch or cut and put rubbing alcohol on it immediately. So my high ass is thinking a ghost had just tried to take me into the depths and I got out of the water as quick as possible. Upon closer inspection on the log I realized that it was a jellyfish sting and I laughed it off. The sun was going down quickly and I remembered that I had quite a trek back to my car. The jellyfish sting was also a huge damper on my mood so I grabbed up everything and by the time I made it to the boardwalk again it was dusk. The boardwalk was probably a half a mile walk back to my car. I had only barely started walking down it when I heard someone talking. A few seconds later I came across a dirty, older looking homeless man talking to himself, swinging around a huge machete at plants on the side. I froze in my tracks not knowing what the hell to do. He was slowly walking in the direction I was so I decided to try to keep pace with him and follow behind as quietly as possible. This was going well for about five minutes and then he just stopped. I froze in place not knowing what to do. I decided to just walk by as quickly and calmly as possible in hopes that he wouldn't say anything to me and just keep swinging his machete at the plants. As soon as I passed him, I heard him say something to me. He must have been on something too because I couldn't understand what he said. I didn't look back and I didn't say anything at all, I just kept walking. I heard his footsteps start to follow behind me. I picked up the pace hoping that he would lose interest. Unfortunately, this didn't happen. I heard him right behind me following me a few feet behind, and every once in a while he'd say something but I ignored him and never looked back. In my mind, I was convinced that if I looked back, he would attack me with that machete and it would be all over. He started saying things to me more frequently but I still refused to look back or respond in any way. He was becoming angry that I wouldn't acknowledge him and began shouting. I felt the wind from the machete swing behind me and I started to just full on run at that point. I knew the parking lot wasn't too far away by now and I figured my heightened senses from that dose would easily allow me to outrun him. To my horror he began running too. It was completely dark outside now and my adrenaline was in full force. I finally made it to the lot and somehow got my keys out of my bag in record time. I jumped in my car and floored it out of there. When I was coming out of the circle I saw him standing off to the side of the road. He was screaming something and angrily swinging that machete around. I tried to come towards my car but I honked the horn and drove past him flying down the road away from this maniac. My friends had always warned me against these little adventures as I was a young, fairly good looking girl. It was a running joke that I'd get murdered one day while on one of these, and that experience made me realize how real of a possibility that could actually be. I found myself in quite a predicament, owning an apartment but completely broke. Desperate to make some extra cash, I decided to rent out the empty room in my apartment, despite my reservations about sharing my space. I am aware of the unfortunate reality of our world, where crimes are committed for monetary gain and have read about various conspiracies and documentaries that only add to my distrust. However, sometimes you must do what you can to make ends meet, even if it means taking risks. Once I had posted the advertisement, my phone began to ring incessantly, with most of the callers being single women looking for a roommate. While I admit I was intrigued by the prospect, I couldn't shake the feeling that the situation could quickly turn into one of those chilling crime documentaries I had watched. 
and it was not a risk I was willing to take. Despite my best efforts, I had yet to find a suitable roommate among the few men who had expressed interest in sharing an apartment with me. My discerning mind had detected flaws in all of them, leaving me with little hope of finding someone who met my expectations. However, my luck changed when I received a call from my longtime friend Jared. He was in town and needed a temporary place to stay while he searched for his living arrangement. Without hesitation, I offered to share my apartment with him, hoping he would accept. To my great relief, he agreed to my proposal, and I felt a sense of contentment, knowing that I would be living with someone I could trust. He swiftly moved in the following day, and we proceeded with our day-to-day -day routine. He was amiable, never encroaching on my personal affairs, and respected my privacy. However, that was not the end of it. I found his company to be enjoyable and entertaining. We sometimes played games together, which was fun. Hey Jared, I'm off to a party. If someone named Susan rings the bell, don't open the door. I informed him that since he was new. Jared looked perplexed and asked me, who is Susan? Just some psycho girl who lives in the building. I have never met her, but she occasionally rings the bell. I replied while tying my shoelaces. Jared seemed more curious and asked me, why? I took a deep breath before responding. I don't know, but I have heard a conspiracy theory about her from our building security guard that she does illicit behaviors. Therefore, I prefer to avoid any interaction with her. Jared nodded in understanding, but still seemed confused. But why does someone named Susan ring your doorbell? I shrugged and said, that is an excellent question, Jared. Unfortunately, I do not have an answer to that. However, I do not want to waste more time thinking about it. I appreciate your help in keeping our home safe while I'm away. See you later. And with that, I left for the party. While his question was valid, I never tried to ask the girl what she wanted due to my paranoia. I thoroughly enjoyed myself at the party that night and had the pleasure of meeting a stunning Latina woman. We hit it off quite well, and I secured her contact information for future dates. However, after consuming too many drinks, I realized I could not drive and opted for a taxi home. As I was wobbling to my apartment, I noticed a girl going downstairs. For some reason, she looked familiar, but I couldn't pinpoint where I had seen her before. I was too drunk to think, so I dragged myself to the apartment gate and unlocked it. As I walked in, I found the lights were off, so I went to turn it on. Just when I took a step after turning the lights on, I stumbled over something and fell. My eyes tried to find the source only to land on the most horrible sight, making me sober immediately. A pool of blood on the floor. And as my eyes trailed the blood, Jared was bleeding and lifeless. I rushed to his side and checked his pulse, but he was dead. There were multiple stab wounds on his body. Someone had brutally done this to him. My mind went to that girl I had seen earlier on the stairs, and I wondered if she had done it. I was panicked and trembling as I dialed 911 and informed them about Jared's body. That girl I was sure I had seen her somewhere. I tried harder to remember where I had seen her, and that was when I remembered the first time a girl rang my doorbell after I heard Susan's conspiracy theory. It was the same girl. Was she Susan? And if she was, then does she murder people too? My body started shaking at the thought of that. 
I was relieved I had never opened the door for her, but I was terrified by Jared's death. People arrived within half an hour while I was curled up in a corner, shaking from the terror that had taken over my body. They started asking me questions about where I was when this happened, etc., and I told them everything, including the girl I saw on the stairs. I was questioned for hours about everything. It seemed they were suspecting me for murder as well. But after I proved it to them, with the help of the Latina girl I met at the party and the guy who hosted it, I was clear to go. But I was scared to return to that building. So I called my sister and asked if I could stay for a few days and she agreed. She lived a few blocks away so I walked there. I told her my friend was murdered at my apartment, but didn't give her more details. Brother, I'm going to shower. If my friend drops by, please invite her in and give her something to drink from. As she was saying that, her doorbell rang. Never mind, here she is. She went to open the door, and the moment I heard the name Susan from my sister's mouth, I turned to see, and there she was smiling as if nothing had happened. Our eyes met and an eerie smile formed on her lips, sending me chills. I don't think we were safe anymore. Let me tell you that I am a prisoner and I am in jail. I was charged with the murder of my husband and I accept it. I don't feel any regret in doing so, as he was a maniac and he deserved this. I killed him with my own hands, and after that, I surrendered to the cops. Most of you were thinking why I killed him. Just listen to my story from the start and you will know this. I was married to a couple of heavy alcoholic business freaks who was habitual to drinking. Since he was my father's business partner, there was no point in my choice and my own decisions. Just after my graduation, I got the bad news that he had selected a boy, and after three months, I was married to that freak. He was a complete monster in bed, and I knew this on my first day after marriage. He made me scream and cry with pain just to fulfill his satisfaction. I begged him, but he tortured me mercilessly. I could think of nothing but only how someone could do this to her own wife. After that day, I was abused again and again, to my breaking point by my own husband. I couldn't bear his torture any, and just after four months of getting married, we got apart. I applied for a divorce, but he didn't sign it. It was not a big deal for me as I had decided not to return to him ever again. Soon, after being apart, I got to know that I was having his child in my belly. I was pregnant, but being a mother, I knew that it was not his or her fault, so I decided to give birth to him and live with him happily. After nine months, I gave birth to a beautiful and cute baby girl. I knew that if he would know about this, there was no way he was going to accept her as his child, but neither was I going to tell him. We have divorced already, at least from my side, and that was enough for me. I raised my baby to be a nice young girl and everything was good until she turned 16. In all these years, I had never heard about him and neither did I want to. But that was my biggest mistake to think that he had left me alone. It was winter and it was too cold outside, so everyone used to go to bed early and our house was not connected to any of our neighbors. One day, he returned to me again, but this time as a totally different person. I was fooled by his words and fell into his trap. I accepted him by giving him mercy, but on the same day, he showed his true colors. He returned home like before in a completely drunk condition. I couldn't let him see my daughter in this condition, so I asked my daughter to go into her room, but he was a maniac and alcoholic. He came to me and started beating me and abusing me. I was crying and screaming for help, but there was no one except my daughter. She couldn't see me in that state and ran to protect me, but she was not aware of him and that was the biggest mistake she made. She tried to stop her, 
but he kicked her so hard that she fell into a corner and couldn't get up, but screamed in pain. He was angry with her, so he pulled me by my hair and looked at me inside the room. After this, he went to my daughter and raped her. He was a complete maniac, and even with her daughter, he acted like a beast. I could hear my daughter scream in pain while he was abusing her, but I was helpless and I couldn't do anything. All of a sudden, the whole thing was covered with scary silence. I shouted for my daughter and asked my husband to leave her from inside the room. After a few seconds, I heard footsteps coming toward me. I started begging him to open the door, and he opened it. I pushed him and ran to my daughter. She was lying on the floor and was bleeding. She was covered with scratches and brushes all over her body and was lying on the floor completely nude. It was his doing. The beast even didn't leave her daughter. I shook her again and again and shouted at her to get up, but she wasn't reacting at all. And how could she when she was already dead? She couldn't bear his torture and it was all due to him. I looked at him with killer intention, and he shouted at me and asked me to bring a chilled drink for him from the refrigerator. I didn't say a word to him. I stood up, went to the refrigerator, and took out a bottle of red wine. He was sitting on the sofa facing me. The wine bottle was chilled and was making my hands numb. The drink inside was frozen, rock hard. I raised the bottle and hit my husband on the head several times until I could see him all covered in blood. I killed him with my own hands and then laughed out loud, but the tears won't stop bursting out of my eyes. I went to my daughter's body and I told her that I was responsible for her death and I was the one who gave him another chance. I should have killed him when he was doing such things with me, but I left her and let him kill my daughter. After sitting for about an hour, I called the cops and asked them to come to my house. When they arrived, they found two dead bodies and I was sitting there. They asked me, and I told them everything. They felt pity for me, but I had killed my husband. It was part of their duty to arrest me. I was arrested and charged with killing my husband, even though he was the one who killed my daughter. But I was not feeling guilty and neither did I regret what I did. He was a demon, and he deserved his punishment. The only guilt I had was that just because of my little mistake, my sweet daughter lost her life. She had her whole life ahead of her, and now she was buried in the ground with all her dreams. I ask this question to my readers. What do you think? What I did was wrong or not? Decide this and think to yourself what you had done if you were in my place. My older brother was one of those people who liked to scare me and my other siblings as much as possible. I couldn't really blame him for it because, although I didn't like being scared myself, I was just as guilty as trying to scare our younger brothers and sisters as well. But... Kids are allowed to be a little hypocritical, aren't we? The thing that always scared me the most was this big old house that my brother and I walked by every day on the way to and from school. The town we lived in didn't have bus service for any of the kids who lived in the town itself, so we had to walk to school. It was a good half an hour walk. The house that my brother always talked about was a really old Victorian that of course looked like it hadn't been kept up in decades. The lawn was completely dead and there was not anything but brown grass. An old dead tree was in the backyard with a decayed tire swing swaying from it. Old broken bicycles, tricycles, and other contraptions littered the backyard as well. There was an old rusty shed there too. There was never a car in the driveway, and we never saw anyone leaving or entering the place. But we knew that someone lived there because if you walked by in the evening, 
You could see blue light shining from behind the curtains as if somebody was inside watching TV in the dark. Whenever the two of us walked by the house, my brother would always make strange comments about what was going on in there. I had to pretend like it didn't scare me, but I was only 12 years old at the time, and I was quite easily scared. He would tell me the man was a butcher who preyed on the little kids in the neighborhood who were stupid enough to walk up to his front door. My brother said the old man would grab the kid, take them out to his shed, hang them from their feet, and then lightly slice their skin open with a fine knife, and then slowly let them die as the blood trickled out into a tub that was under them. Growing up, every time he was in the mood to do it, my brother would dare me to go to the guy's door and break one of the old pots on it. I always declined because I told him I didn't want to get in trouble. He would then make fun of me for being a scaredy cat and taunt me for hours. On Halloween, the year that I turned 12, rather than going trick-or-treating, I was invited to hang out with my brother and his friends. They were doing what we at the time considered mature things. We egged some houses. We lit a flaming bag or two. It was a fun night. Late in the night, my brother and his friends decided to haze the new guy, being me. They dared me to go up to the old Victorian house and break one of the pots on the porch. As much as I wanted to be accepted by my brother and his friends, I did not want to do that. And they taunted me for it. And it was humiliating. But my fear was much stronger than the humiliation, and I continued to refuse to do it. When the taunting got really bad, I angrily blurted out to my brother, Well, if you're so brave, why don't you go do it? My brother hadn't expected that, and it worked perfectly because one of his buddies immediately turned to him and asked him that as well. Suddenly, all the attention was off of me, and it was turned to my brother. He was really taken off guard by the development. Still, my brother had to prove that he had the guts to do it. It was one thing for his little brother to be taunted, but he knew he could never live it down. So, acting all brave, although I could tell he was really scared, my brother walked up to the porch of the old building. You could tell he was scared out of his mind, but he didn't let it show. When he got up the steps, he grabbed an old flower pot and pulled it over his head. As he held the pot above him, proud of himself for what he was doing, I saw the door open behind him. A huge man walked up behind him as he was about to throw the pot. His buddy started screaming at my brother, telling him there was someone behind him. He just looked at us all like he didn't believe us. He just thought that they were trying to scare him. As he dropped the pot on the ground and it shattered though, the guy grabbed my brother around the neck and held him there. My brother's chicken friends all ran off immediately. I couldn't do that though. My brother had just been grabbed by a lunatic. I ran up to them before the guy could pull my brother into the house and tried to pull my brother away. The man swatted at me several times. He was huge, and he was choking the life out of my brother. Not knowing what else to do, I realized I had to take the cheapest shot possible. It was the only way I could help my brother. I kicked the guy square in the crotch. He groaned in shock, 
but he didn't let go of my brother. So I kicked him again. And again. I kicked this huge man a total of six times before he finally let go of my brother. Although my brother was wheezing and struggling to breathe, I knew we had to get away from the recently sterilized psychopath and I pulled him away. It was difficult, but we were able to get out of his yard and down the street before he was able to do anything. Our parents called the police, but get this, they wouldn't do anything about it. My brother was not only trespassing, but he vandalized the guy's porch. We were all shocked and my parents were outraged, but the police did absolutely nothing. This man got away with it. Now, I'm the first one to admit what my brother did was wrong, but the guy was strangling him. Afterwards, my parents drove my brother and I to and from school every day. They figured it was best to avoid the guy as much as possible. The one good thing that came out of this was my brother had a lot more respect for me. It was at least two months before he began ragging on me again. But that's how brothers are. My story takes place in 2014. I was two years out of college and couldn't keep a job to save my life. My attitude wouldn't change until much later. Anyhow, I got connected with a house-sitting agency. The job itself was cool, but the woman running the place was just a jerk to everyone. You may be seeing a pattern here, but I promise you, in this case, I wasn't the actual problem. Well, I put up with her terrible attitude for as long as possible. Nevertheless, the day came when I gave her a piece of my mind. I've gotten a whopping three months of experience in the business at this point, and somewhere in my crazy mind I got the idea I knew the business better than her, and I decided to go independent. I put up a post selling my skills on a few sites. Nothing came out of it at first, but I got my first call on that following Monday. This job unfortunately fell through at the last minute. I was back at the beginning. It took six more days before another offer came through, and this was from a family just ten miles from me. They were planning a vacation and needed someone to take care of their dog. The father with whom I spoke sounded very nice. We made an appointment for the following day for me to come around. The next day I dressed in my best outfit and drove out to meet them. The house was set off by itself on four acres near the county line, a mostly rural area. I'd sat for another family nearby, so I had no reason to be suspicious. As I pulled up to the house, I was a little disappointed by the state of the place. Despite being a large house, it was somewhat run down. Also, the family's two cars were at least ten years old and a little beat up. I didn't want to be a snob, but I had a feeling the inside wouldn't be much better. The idea of spending three nights there sounded a lot less appealing now. None of this mattered, though. I had made an appointment and I was going to keep it. Besides, nothing said I had to take the job if I didn't want it. With all this in mind, I rang the bell and put on my happiest face. The door was answered by a well-dressed young man who identified himself as the father. It did strike me as odd that a man would dress so neatly but stop at his shoes. A pair of old, raggedy running shoes, but I assumed he had a reason and put it out of my mind. He invited me in and we sat together in the kitchen. I was relieved to see that the interior was in better shape, but I did notice a slight musty smell. The job was looking a bit of a mixed bag. I was leaning toward turning it down, but what came in the next half hour or so would determine my final decision. While we waited for his wife to join us, the man and I made small talk. I was told she was putting the kids down for a nap and would be just a moment. I could hear movement down the hall. There was no indication that he was lying. However, as the seconds passed, small little things began to bother me. For starters, there was no sign any pets or children lived there. No toys laying around, no sippy cups, no water bowls or dog beds. The closer I looked, the less it looked like anyone lived there at all. Yet, 
It was fully furnished, but no dishes sat on the counters or appliances ran in the background. I began to feel a slight unease. Something was telling me to get out. And while this was all going on inside my head, the father was talking. He was telling a story and using his hands a lot. And this was when I noticed his fingernails. Why would a man who seemed to care so much about his appearance have such dirty fingernails? Strike two. This is a mid-level office worker if I had to guess. He would certainly not be doing manual labor. Even if he had a hobby like woodworking, wouldn't he bother to at least clean under his nails? I'm well aware of how stupid this all sounds, but put it together, with all the other things I've noticed, my instincts were telling me to leave. I knew if something was wrong I needed to play it cool. If not, I didn't want to cause a scene. No sense in destroying a business before I even got it off the ground. As calmly as I could, I said I had forgotten something in my car. I'd go out and grab it, then return in just a moment. I smiled and stood up. As I turned to walk away, the man grabbed my wrist and held me. Strike three. This was all the proof I needed. My heart began to pound. He looked at me and spoke through gritted teeth. You're not going anywhere, honey. All the kindness had left his voice. The true face now stared coldly back at me. Panic surged through every inch of my body. I knew I wasn't going to leave this place the same person I was when I entered. That is, if I ever left at all. I noticed his eyes jumping back and forth from me to the hall. He appeared nervous. Perhaps his partner or partners were being detained by something. All I knew was that I had to get away before they arrived. I waited until he looked toward the hall again and took my chance. I yanked my arm away as hard as I could. His temporary lack of focus gave me just enough advantage to break free. I ran straight for the front door. I had wisely worn flats instead of my usual heels. This decision was the thing that allowed me to get away. Any woman reading this knows why. And no sooner had I broken free, my captor yells out to his accomplices. Why he hadn't called to them until now still eludes me. Not bothering to lock my car door was another choice I'd made that would ultimately benefit me. The distance, although just a few feet from the door to my car, seemed like miles. I made it into my car and was able to lock the door before they managed to catch me. It wasn't until I was in the midst of juggling with my keys that I saw the second of the men. While I struggled to get my car started, my now two assailants banged on the car and pulled at the door handle. The second man was much larger than the other. There was no way I would have gotten away from him. I did finally get the car going and sped away from the property. It was the first time I can recall taking a breath in the preceding five minutes. As I sped down the highway, I called 911 to report my near abduction. I wasn't sure if my attackers were still pursuing me or not. Instead of heading home, I made for the nearest police station. I didn't dare let my guard down until I was safely inside the building and speaking to an officer. I quickly repeated my incident to the cop. He filed a report while we waited to hear from the patrol cars that had been sent to the house. It wasn't a shock to hear that the men had fled. What did shock me was what the officers discovered in the master bedroom. The report stated the following, but I will be paraphrasing. When officers White and Dawson reached the largest bedroom of the home, they discovered it had been stripped bare of furniture. In place of the furniture, the walls and floors had been covered in multiple layers of what looked to be contractor's plastic sheeting. What purpose the assailants had in mind for the room can only be guessed at this time. I still tear up at the thought of what awaited me in that room. I've never been a religious person, but I can't help but feel someone or something was watching out for me that day. I wish I could say that my would-be attackers were caught and are now doing life in prison, but the truth is, they remain unidentified to this day. The house they had used turned out to be uninhabited. After the death of the owner, the family had let it lay fallow. No further hints were needed. I decided the independent house-sitting business wasn't for me. I continued to bounce between jobs until I got on with a small printing shop. The family that runs the place are the kindest folks I've ever met, and they were far more forgiving of my little quirks than my previous employers. I'm coming up on my fourth year with them, and I hope I'll be there until my retirement. 
Now that I'm seven years older and more mature, I've learned just how dangerous the world can be. In my early 20s, I wouldn't have thought twice about traveling to strange places alone. In retrospect, my overconfidence in my ability to protect myself is what led me to that house, and no one could have convinced me I was wrong. Since that day, I've become much more vigilant about my safety. I don't go anywhere without crossing all my T's and dotting my I's. By far, the most important thing I do is listen to my instincts. They are what saved me that day. And don't worry about offending someone if you feel you may be in danger. We have these senses for a reason. Please, pay them close attention and be careful, ladies. Goodbye, and stay safe. I used to work at a place called O'Hurley's General Store here in Shepherdston, West Virginia. It was a real old-timey general store, the kind that sells everything from buckets and barrels to books and pocket watches, in addition to the regular selection of groceries and liquor. It was an alright job for a young man such as myself, patronized by generally polite and well-meaning folk. Sure, I had a fair few drunks get a little rowdy when I wouldn't sell them hard liquor on a Sunday, but... Nobody ever put a gun in my face. But that ain't to say that I didn't have one or two incidents in there that put the fear of God into me, and this here is one of them. So I'm working late one Saturday night, stacking shelves and cleaning house when a man walks in wearing a black tailored suit. It was one of those that fit him like a glove and gave off an obvious air of wealth, which marked him as an out-of-towner in my book. But that suit was just about the only normal thing about him. He was white as the cotton fields, so pale he was almost gaunt, with razor-sharp facial features and slick-back silver hair. I hear the little bell on the front entrance tinkle, so I do my thing and walk back behind the counter to serve him, which is where I laid eyes on him. He walks up to me, and with this wolfish smile on his lips, asks me for a can of lighter fluid. I fetch him what he asked for, making a little small talk as I ringing him up on the register. I asked him where he's from. DC, he replies, just passing through. I gave him a polite smile and asked him if he was one of those politician types, to which he gives the vague reply of something like that. He then proceeds to take out the biggest roll of dollar bills I'd ever seen in my life, all hundreds from what I could tell then places one down on the counter in front of me. I give the man his change, remarking that it's a good thing it had been a busy previous few hours or he'd have wiped me out for change. I said it in this fairly jokey tone, expecting him to at least give a polite chuckle in return, but he doesn't so much as smirk. He just takes out the Zippo lighter from his suit pocket, just about the shiniest I'd ever seen, and proceeds to fill it up with the lighter fluid right there in front of me. I've seen a fair few of those lighters in my time, but never one that I could have sworn was plated with silver. I figured he must have been hankering for a smoke, something fierce, and I told him as such, but he replied that he didn't smoke. Right as he says that, he finishes up filling up his lighter, but not before accidentally spilling a little of the lighter fluid onto his finger. Then just before he pieces the shiny looking Zippo back together, he brings the finger to his mouth and sucks the drop of flammable liquid from his finger like it was a drop of homemade wine or something. Now, naturally, I quietly recoil when he does that, not quite being able to believe what I just witnessed. He sees me do so and shoots me another one of those wolfish grins like he enjoyed the idea of freaking me out like that. I was just on the verge of asking him what that was all about when I hear the doorbell of the general store tinkle again. I look over towards the front entrance and in walks this young lady who looks to be about the same age as my little sister, couldn't have been no older than about 14 years old. Only she's dressed much younger, almost like how you'd expect a toddler to dress, in this denim skirt type thing with white embroidered flowers on it. She addresses him as daddy, so... I figured it was his daughter, and tells him she needs to use the bathroom. The man in the suit then turns to me, asks if there's a bathroom that his daughter can use so 
I give him the key to one that we had inside the store. Only instead of just handing it to his kid, he takes out a little leather wallet looking thing from his jacket and hands that, the lighter, then the key to the little lady who then makes her way off towards the door before locking it behind her. I started to feel incredibly uncomfortable. Something about the whole situation just didn't sit right with me at all. I had a sneaking suspicion of what was contained inside the small leather wallet thing, but I didn't feel like I was in any position to confront the suited man on it, especially not based solely on a hunch. But it wasn't just that. The kid looked absolutely nothing like him. She had these soft, rounded, delicate features along with real curly hair while the suited man's face was so sharp he looked like he could have cut a swath through a pumpkin patch. And the way she called him Daddy, a girl that age should be well on to calling her father Dad, Pop, or anything but Daddy. I tried to distract from my discomfort by asking him where he and his daughter were headed. You ask a lot of questions, don't you, young man? He replied, dropping what had once been a kind of formal civility entirely and proceeded to stare a hole through me. His eyes, man. He had these narrow brown eyes so dark that were almost black and I felt a shudder run through me as he fixed his gaze to mine. Just making conversation, I remember saying back to him, shifting nervously behind the counter. We well, you know how the old saying goes, don't you? His voice was smooth, just creepily calm like there was no emotion behind it whatsoever. Curiosity killed the cat. The suited man turned, then started walking up and down the aisles, eyeing up the products like we were some quaint backwater relic, which I suppose was exactly what we were. I get back to cleaning house for a minute or two, only it's more just going through the motions while I keep an eye on what this guy's doing. I figured it'd only be a minute or two before his kid emerges from the bathroom, and they fix to get back on the road. But five minutes goes by, then ten, and still no sign of her. Just as I'm about to ask him if he thinks she's okay in there, the bathroom door unlocks with a loud snap and the door opens up. There's no flush, nothing to indicate she'd actually been using the bathroom for its intended purpose, and when she emerges, she seems all sleepy and dozy looking. Then she hands back the keys, the lighter, and the black leather wallet to the suited man in a daze before giving him a lazy sounding, thank you daddy. The way she said it right then, I knew he wasn't her father and it was dripping with sleaze. And the look he gave her in return was one a father should never, ever give his daughter under any circumstances. It made me sick to my stomach and I wanted the pair of them out of my store immediately. But we rarely just come out and say something like that where I'm from. We'll say something with an implication if you catch my drift. Safe travels now, I remember saying to the suited man. My tone was friendly, but the look I gave him was not. He turns and looks at me like he was about to go through me for shortcut, like he could have eaten me without salt there and then. Then he walks up to the counter, places the bathroom key down on top of it, and says one final thing to me. Remember, young man, curiosity killed the cat. Then he walks that little lady out of the store and then drove off into the night. I seriously considered calling the sheriff right after they left. But what was I going to tell him? That a man was traveling with a girl that appeared to be his daughter? I'd be laughed right off the line. I could have mentioned that I thought that there was something illegal in the leather wallet that he'd handed her, but I got the distinct impression that nothing we could ever accuse him of was really going to stick. He had all that money, and that look he gave me too. So I didn't say a word to anyone. But for the remaining few hours of my shift, and for the next few days, I heard his words rattling around my skull whenever I paid any mind to him at all. Curiosity. Killed the cat. This happened a few months ago to my friends and I. 
We are university students in Cape Town, South Africa, so when we aren't trying to just get through the semester, we like to let our habits get the better of us and go out for drinks. On this night, we had just finished what felt like an extra long day at university and decided to head to a bar about five minutes from campus for some much needed stress relief. The evening was going well, although a bit slow. It was enjoyable with everyone having a drink and getting a bit restless. So me being one of the more outgoing ones in the group, I suggested we head to the pool bar not far from where we were. Everyone agrees and we get our stuff to go. We all jump in my car and we get to the bar, but being a Thursday night, parking was a bit scarce. I finally managed to find a spot about a block away from the bar, but in a secluded side street. I should also mention that this bar is in one of the sketchier parts of town, but is normally quite safe due to the amount of nightlife associated with being so close to a university. We walked to the bar and no one really felt uneasy, nor did anything happen to make us feel that way, which was quite surprising. After a few hours of some pool and just relaxing, we decided it was time to go grab some dinner before restaurants close, as being in South Africa means that most restaurants, even fast food, close really, really early at around 7 or 8 p.m. to comply with the curfew. We decided to stop at the pizza place below the bar to grab some food before we all decided what the plan was for the end of the night. So because our group was so large and the pizza place being so small, we decided to have those getting food go inside while the others who didn't would just wait outside on the street. This was an easy decision as the pizza place had a massive open window with built-on counter so we could still all talk to each other. This is where things started getting a little weird. While we were waiting for our friends inside the pizza place to come out, this massive white van pulls up past us and stops. The driver wasn't an intimidating looking dude. He was skinny, looked to be about average height with shoulder length blonde hair. A pretty standard looking dude for the kind of area we were in. He calls me and asks me if I think his van could fit in a parking spot just behind him. For perspective, this parking spot could probably fit like a small hatchback, maybe. This dude is driving a full long sized panel van. This makes me kind of uneasy as I thought that as a driver of a car, you should know where your car can definitely not fit, and this is one of them. I explained to him that I didn't think it was even worth attempting. He responds by telling me that he has faith in his ability, and I should come stand behind the van and direct him in. This gives me major red flags, and after a few back and forths, he just pulls the emergency brake up and sits and stares at my friends and I for what felt like an eternity. He then thanked us and drove off. This sparks my friends to come outside from the pizza place as they just saw what happened and were very confused. We all were kind of weirded out, but think nothing of it and everyone gets their pizza and we try to decide what the plan is for the last hour or two we have before curfew cuts things short. Most of us decide this is where our night is probably going to end as we're all kind of weirded out by the guy in the van. A few others decide that they were going to stay and just Uber home a little later in the evening. With our group number cut down to four, we decided to walk back to the car and just head home. When we left the pizza place, a homeless person called at us and was insisting we had nothing to worry about with the guy in the van, which didn't help with anyone's nerves. We then decided to head to the car, but as soon as we turned the corner to approach the side street where the car was parked, we see Van Man again. This time, not so happy as he seemed in his encounter earlier. I made a cheeky comment about him finally finding a parking spot so he could fit in while we were walking past each other and he just stared at my friends and I not breaking eye contact even when we passed him. I turned around to see if he was still looking. He was, but as we turned the corner of the side street with the car, I saw it and my heart sank. The van, horribly parked half on and half off the sidewalk, back door slightly open. Upon seeing this, I turn around and see Van Man is now walking towards us, but he said something that confused me at first, but immediately made sense after. He said, Hey, please just watch my car. Which confused me, but when he said that, four men sat up from leaning on the wall next to it and began following us. My friends and I were slightly ahead of them, so we were trying to discuss the game plan because it was obvious if we did nothing something horrible was going to happen. 
My friends start walking faster and I remain at the same speed, frantically searching my pockets for my car keys, all the while shouting at my friends to wait up and asking what the rush was. All this was in hopes that the guys behind us, who were gaining on us at that point, were oblivious to us knowing that they had sinister intentions. As soon as the car came into view, we booked it, jumped in and drove away. But we were only mere seconds from not being that lucky. After locking the car doors, I saw the men surrounding the car. I managed to get us out and, looking back in the mirror, I saw a fifth man by the van at the bottom of the street. I still have no idea what their intentions were that night, if it were to rob us, or just beat us up, or worse. I don't really like to think about it and really do consider how lucky we were that night. I ask that when you're out, no matter how innocent an interaction with someone can seem, always pay attention to the little things. I never thought that I'd have anything to post on the subreddit, but here we go. This literally just happened, so I had to try to keep this as short and as organized as possible. My 29-year-old female and my partner is a 23-year-old female. We were back in her own town visiting her family for about a week. It's a very small, isolated town in the middle of nowhere, and basically in the middle of the woods. While we were here, she wanted to meet up with an old high school friend who still lives in the area. We'll call him Kyle. So we meet Kyle at the beach, and right away he's acting super weird, making jokes about a three-way with us and just making a bunch of just unwelcome, gross comments. Obviously, we're unfortunately used to this stuff to a certain extent, but coming from someone who is supposed to be her good friend, it was extra annoying. So my girlfriend and I are shooting each other panic looks the whole time. Once he's out of earshot for a second, she says that she's sorry. That he's never been like this before. And we can make an excuse to leave. When he comes back, we tell him we want to get dinner at a local bar. But he just asked to join us. We felt awkward. So we end up saying yes. He says he doesn't know quite how to get there, so he follows us. We get their order drinks and food, then head out to the patio with the drinks. He makes a few more gross comments, but it's generally been way more cool and normal than he was at the beach. We're smoking some weed on the patio and chilling. The food comes quick and we finish it quicker. Now, here's where it gets really messed up. So halfway through my first drink, I'm feeling really tired which makes sense, as we've had a long day. I give my girlfriend the signal that I want to go. She makes an excuse that we need to go. He keeps trying to get us to come to his house. I've got some good weed and dives there, and you can meet my cats, blah, blah, blah. He's being really pushy. We keep saying no and making excuses. We need to check on her grandpa, etc. So finally we get in the car and say goodnight. We park next to each other and walk up and into the cars together while saying our goodbyes. And we get into the car. My girlfriend informs me that she wants to stay at the bar, but fake it like we're leaving because she doesn't want to chill with them anymore, understandably. So we're sitting in the car waiting for him to leave first when he signals for us to roll down the window. We do. He says GPS has been kind of funny and we can lead him to the main road. To be fair, we're in the middle of nowhere, so this didn't seem too outlandish. So, obviously, staying behind at the bar was out of the question. So in the car, we were talking about how pushy she was being, and she admitted she feels weird driving right back to her grandpa's house. So we should drive into town until we lose him. He's behind this for a long time, even way after he should have gotten off on his exit. We think it's weird, but we weren't sure what to do. So finally, we get on a two-lane road, and he pulls up next to us, and he's waving a phone, which is clearly my girlfriend's phone in the window. We pull over, he gives her the phone back, chats for just a few seconds, then leaves in a hurry. Here is the part that makes my skin crawl. We know we had her phone. 
I saw her put it in her fanny pack, which was on the table, along with my phone and her butt. A few minutes before we left the bar as we were preparing to leave, she didn't take it back out. There's literally no way she could have left at the bar. More importantly, he got in his car and left the bar at the same time as us, meaning he had to have already had the phone when we were leaving. It's not like we left the bars first and he saw it left on the table or something. He literally handled it and walked into the cars with us and calmly said goodnight with the phone already in his possession. Now, the kicker, apparently unbeknownst to me, my girlfriend had tasted a very weird bitter taste in her straw at the bar and was already suspicious, especially with how he's been acting. This is why she wanted to stay back at the bar, to get away from him and stay in public where she felt it was safer. So when he walked up to the car to return her cell phone, she very casually and deliberately flashed the knife that she kept for protection in her jacket. I didn't know at the time that she had done this. So that's why he had left so quickly. Obviously, I was annoyed with her for not telling me her suspicions sooner. But she just didn't want me to panic. I'm really shaken up. A few things are clear. One, he stole my girlfriend's phone. And it seems like he did so so that he would be forced to pull over on a dark road in the middle of nowhere till he quickly ended the conversation and left when my girlfriend flashed her knife. They'd been good friends for almost 10 years. If he wasn't planning on doing something malicious, I feel like he would have acted confused about the knife or said something like, What's up? Why would you flash a knife at me? Is this as some sort of bad movie or something? But instead, he just booked it. Which tells me he knew exactly what she was doing, reacting to a threat and preparing to protect herself and me. And three, he probably spiked our drinks. My girlfriend noticed a weird taste in her straw right away and chose not to finish her drink. I finished half my drink and I felt relatively tired. A few more things. I just don't know how he managed to nab the phone without us noticing or knowing it doesn't really make any sense. But he did. Me and my girlfriend both remember her putting it in her fanny pack perfectly. We almost had no idea how he could have spiked our drinks unless he was working with the bartender. But we were the ones who suggested that bar. I don't know exactly how he did it. But I think I know why. And for that reason, my girlfriend's now ex-friend who made creepy comments, probably tried to drug us and stole her phone in order to get us alone the dark road. Please keep your distance. During the early 2000s when I was attending law school, I worked nights delivering pizza for one of the national chains. I had done something similar when I was younger and attending my local community college. Anytime I found myself sorely in need of quick cash, that was the avenue I would choose. Despite the many stories I have heard questioning the safety of the job, I never had a single run-in with a thief. I'm sure back in the early days it could be a little dangerous, but by the time I joined the game, companies had learned that implementing practices such as limiting the driver to $20 lowered the chance of holdups drastically. Even though I was never a victim of a robbery, I did have one or two scary incidents I could write about. The worst of these happened to me back in the 2000s. I was very familiar with the city I was living at at the time. Moving there after junior college and delivering for several places over the last five years had made me intimate with almost every nook and cranny of the place. However, one evening I would be called to an address that I nor any of the other drivers even knew existed. When the order came in, I went straight to the map to find the address, but it wasn't there. Not even the GPS on my phone showed it. We didn't have any no-delivery areas at that time, so I had to take it despite my misgivings. Theoretically, 
The place would have existed if the road continued for ten more blocks, so I turned on to said road a block before its ending and followed it south. Sure enough, a newly paved road began where the old one should have ended. For what seemed like miles, I continued on this new section of road. Nothing stood on the other side of it and I didn't pass another car the whole time. How the state managed to build it without a single report of its creation leaking to the media had me bewildered. The five years I'd been driving all over the city, I'd not known this part existed. In one way, I was very excited seeing all of it, like a Victorian explorer tracing the sources of the Nile. But at the same time, a deserted road popping up out of nowhere gave me a chill down my spine. It must have been a good ten minutes before the house in question appeared in the distance. I couldn't understand why someone would build a house out here in the middle of nowhere with no way to reach it. When I got closer, I could see the house had to be at least fifty years old or more and probably hadn't been repaired since then. No cars were around and, for a moment, I thought the house was abandoned, but I could see the front door wide open behind the rickety old screen. Everything looked to be above board, so I grabbed the pizza and headed for the door. I knocked on the screen door, but got no answer. I could see what appeared to be a young female walking around the kitchen. When I knocked a second time, I heard a female voice say to come in. Despite my reservations, I stepped just inside the house and waited in the small foyer. I had learned from other drivers early on not to enter an unfamiliar house, but I had yet to see anything to concern me. I assumed the woman would be coming out soon to pay me. Instead, I overheard an unseen man whisper, Call him into the kitchen. When I heard that, I fled from that place as fast as I could. I was so freaked out I got back to the restaurant in half the time it took me to get to the house. After I told my boss what had just occurred, he called the police. All the excitement had me rattled, so my boss sent me home for the day. My phone rang a few hours later. It was the police. They'd called to let me know what they had found. Whoever had been there was gone now. Even though the place had more than likely been abandoned for a while, they did find evidence that people had just recently been inside. This was stuff my boss had already told them. However, they did shed light on where the road came from and why the house was the only building on an otherwise deserted area. The state had been trying to purchase the land on which the new section of road and house were for 20 years, but the landowner wouldn't sell. They even tried to use eminent domain to get it, but a judge blocked it. Around two years before, the owner passed and his children finally sold the land to the state. They were so happy to get the land after all that time, the construction on the road was started immediately. It technically had yet to be formally opened, but locals had already began using it anyway. This was good to know, but I still wondered how the two people knew about the empty house sitting out in the middle of nowhere. This was something the officer didn't know. We could only assume they drove past it and decided it would be as good a place as any to ambush a delivery driver. Even $20 is a good score if you're desperate enough. He said from personal experience, people have killed for much less. The officer left me with one good piece of news though. The county had slated the old house to be demolished in the coming week, so no other poor delivery driver would be let out there to be robbed or worse. Two days later, I was driving down the brand new road which I was now using as a shortcut across town and witnessed the house's destruction. A load was even being lifted from my shoulders right before my eyes. Never again would I enter a customer's home or even deliver to an area in which I was not well versed. Perhaps in the future, I'll share my other story. While not as harrowing, it was still scary nonetheless. About eight years ago now, me and my dad and a few of my cousins were fishing down in southern Maryland one summer. We were out of the particular spot where there are these things called target ships. These are old decommissioned navy ships that have been mounted on top of concrete pillars so they can float no matter how much the navy tests munitions on them. 
They get shot at by all kinds of vehicles, with all kinds of bullets, bombs, and missiles. But anyway, we're all on my dad's grady white fishing for croaker and flounder right near these target ships. If they're actually being used for military exercises, you can't even get near them. So since there's no one out there to wave us away, we were out near the target ships with about 20 other boats in the water. But then, sure enough, about an hour and some guy from the Coast Guard sails up to us. They're on a big old CG boat with about 15 trainees on board, and the officer in command asks a favor from my dad. He wants to know if he can practice a little inspection drill with a few of his trainees. Being the good guy he is, my dad gives him permission, then renders them coming on board. I feel my rod getting all heavy all of a sudden. I call it out, and the Coast Guard officer stops his inspection and says, Go ahead, son. Reel it up. Let's see what you got. So I reel and reel. And it's really obvious how heavy whatever I've caught is. So naturally, we're all getting mad excited. Then, to all of our absolute horror, I pull the thing from the water. And we all see that it is an unexploded bomb. It was a cylindrical diamond shape with neon green stabilizers, about 12 to 14 inches long and four inches in diameter at its thickest part. Well now, the officer, the trainee, and the entire boat of Coast Guard has just witnessed what I pulled out of the water. And I'm not kidding when I say that. I watched the color drain from all their faces. They went from pink, unhealthy, to skeletal white. And the time it took to say the trainee on our boat literally leaves to his boat, and they all haul it away with their sirens on. This leaves a very rattled Coast Guard officer on our boat, who promptly orders me to not move a single muscle. The Coast Guard gets on our VHF and tells all the boats in the area to leave the target ships. And I'm telling you, you ain't never seen fishing boats move so fast. After about 20 minutes of me sitting there with this bomb on my line, the area is finally cleared away. The officer orders my father to put his boat and drive to achieve a good bit of speed and then don't stop. So my dad goes as he's ordered, puts the boat in gear, and seconds, we're rolling about 15 to 20 knots away from the ship. The absurd brings out a knife, cuts my line, and orders my dad to just throttle the boat and get away as fast as you can. Needless to say, it did not detonate when it hit the bottom of the bay. We took the officer who was pretty clearly shaken back to his ship. I know it's hard to believe the story without proof, but in the situation, we didn't have time to get a picture of it. We tried, but the Coast Guard officer was adamant about us getting out of there as quickly as possible. But take my word for it, it's easily the scariest thing I've ever had happen to me during a fishing trip.